patients with over 300 uh, complex diseases. So clearly the trend is there. And even though there's been a skepticism as to whether or not these associations are strong enough or have the enough component to call them um, uh, how, how, to, how influential they are to common disease, it is clear and there is evidence that we've found associations uh, related to risk prediction, disease classification, drug development, and drug toxicity. So there are clearly examples that encourage us to move uh, forward and to continue in um, uh, moving our research to uh, the clinical setting. So what uh, brings us around the table here is basically how can we uh, move uh, from uh, genetic variation from the human genome all the way down to the clinical practice. And we all are very much aware of the fact that there are different challenges that we need to tackle successfully if we want to get there to, to the patient's bedside. And, and make a, a meaningful contribution. And certainly there are challenges such as the importance of having a robust uh, scientific and ex uh, uh, evidence of effectiveness, the appropriate cost of benefit analysis and risks and risk analysis. Certainly we need to move forward with technology innovation so that we can uh, have uh, uh, cheaper, even cheaper sequence technologies and uh, accessible, uh, accessible bioinformatics. Certainly uh, effective, uh, we need to strengthen our capacities of educating our uh, physicians and uh, counselors so that we can have effective uh, communications of results and, um, and uh, counseling. And uh, no question, policies are, uh, are uh, needed, need to be in place related to um, reimbursement and, co and coverage and certainly many other sensitive ethical, legal, social, economic uh, issues that we need to make sure that are uh, uh, taken care of before uh, we successfully move genomics to the clinic. And there are certainly examples around the globe where um, these in, uh, there are initiatives that are uh, in place so that we can tackle these uh, goals successfully. And among them, and notably the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative in the US and certainly our alliance, our global alliance that uh, uh, contributes to data sharing and, uh, and, and strengthening our, our um, path to uh, precision medicine and others that have been mentioned throughout the day and others that are not in my screen but are uh, important to recognize. Now it is important that we put, uh, uh, that we get um, principles, guidelines, and best practices in place so that we can draft a common framework for successfully developing precision medicine uh, around the globe. But my argument uh, today here is that it is as important to keep in mind the local and regional environment. And what I'm referring to by that is the uh, different populations, social structure, politics, and economics on the different regions of the world so that we can successfully not only develop uh, precision medicine but deploy uh, technologies uh, in, in the healthcare sector. And so it is important that pre these precision medicine uh, uh, are, are, um, our strategies are likely to be different in different parts of the world. And uh, as an example, if we want to be over simplistic here, I will think we should, I will say we might want to think of the industrialized world, which is mostly represented in this room, the emerging economies, middle income countries such as Mexico, India, uh, China, Brazil, and others, South Africa, and developing countries in Africa, um, uh, Latin America, Asia, and other parts of the world. So we most likely will have to take in account the different local environments so that we can uh, be successful in, um, in deploying and developing this path to um, personalized medicine. So what I will be showing, uh, sharing with you um, in the next few minutes uh, it, some experiences of what we've done in Mexico, but again, I found uh, lots of parallelisms with other emerging economies around the world, and I like to drag some lessons learned from these experiences and how we can benefit from, uh, again, um, enhanced engagement with these countries. So it was the year 1999, 2000, when I was called back to my country when I was at Johns Hopkins to participate in drafting and strategy for genomic medicine for the country. It was the time when the Genome Project was uh, coming to an end and the, later on the HapMap Project will emerge. 
So um, by putting several institutions together in different groups, it was clear that um, it was clear that we needed a strategy that could uh, benefit public health, development of policies, uh, and help help, help tackling. Uh, 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 local health disparities. This was uh, these were key issues. Not only that, but also uh, the fact that we could um, reduce uh, disparities, social uh, disparities, and economic disparities, and the fact that uh, the knowledge or the belief at the time that genomic medicine wasn't something that could be just imported from the developed world to the developing uh, countries, and particularly in countries where population ancestries are different, as the case as in the case of Mexico and other parts of the world, as I will be showing in a minute. So uh, these were arguments that uh, indicated that Mexico needed to uh, to uh, boost an effort and uh, and make sure that uh, genomic medicine, uh, a genomic medicine strategy, would be in place. And certainly, as well, those issues related to social, ethical, and legal issues. Uh, when we were, uh, if we keep in mind that Mexico has at least 65 different ethnic groups that speak their own language and are important component of the ancestry uh, of the population. So, um, and, and then later on the argument of the fact that we could, by doing this, contribute to um, to um, the uh, innovation, to innovation and, and, and economic growth. So, that initiative uh, got drafted and it was in 2004 where after lots of work and convincing and uh, fundraising, the Mexican Congress created the National Institute of Genomic Medicine uh, where I had the privilege of serving as the founding director and uh, research started in the different uh, priorities of health in Mexico, namely high, uh, um, uh, diabetes, obesity, and as I said before, uh, the local um, needs. Here is a, 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 a photograph on the groundbreaking uh, ceremony when we started constructing the uh, venue for the institute. Uh, we can see to the to to the right, uh, Dr. Frank Julio Frank. Who I'm sorry, can I go back once? Oh, there you go. Um, Dr. Julio Frank, who was uh, Secretary of Health at the time, and this is no minor prob uh, a point I want to emphasize, the fact that their leadership has, as a physician, and has a PhD in global health, then he became uh, Dean at the Harvard School of Public Health and our current president of the University of Miami, a visionary that could drag uh, innovation to public health, and his role was key. We see. Um, our mentor in between, uh, Professor Sobral and myself, and Francis Collins, who at the time was uh, director of NHGRI, and who was uh, certainly a great partner to grow our institute, our institute uh, to, the, to, the, to the point where it is at this point. So it was, um, we started way beyond this, I mean way before this, we started with the uh, specific uh, research programs, and, and, and before I jump to that, uh, a couple of years later, the uh, venue was ready in the south part of Mexico City at the NIH campus, uh, this was the 13th National Institute of National Institute of Health for Mexico. But as I said before, what we were interested here is, among other things, into identifying uh, what were the what was the makeup of the um, the genomic makeup of the Mexican population. 65 different ethnic groups, and at that time, the hat map was already analyzing the ancestral populations of Africa, Europe, and Asia, and there was no effort to analyze at that point. Uh, populations uh, that were mixed and that were coming from Latin America. So we embarked in this um, in this project, and those states of, of Mexico that are highlighted here in color are the ones we started studying at the beginning. And um, the um, the project went well. We got to to uh, identify and produce a hat map of the Mexican population. But what I want to emphasize the most today is the, um, the uh, social engagement that we were able to craft and create an enthusiasm of the population for genomics. And that, I think, was the hardest part of, uh, of the project. We uh, created a consent form in the format of 12 quest uh, questions and answers, uh, approved, certainly approved by our IRB, and um, 
and we uh, produce uh, communications across the country in different universities uh, and public places and produce this consent form in the form of a poster. The poster was uh, shown and lived uh, posted there for over a week before uh, sample collection date and uh, so that people could uh, look at it uh, at their pace, at their leisure and think whether they wanted to contribute with the sample to the Mexican hat map. And uh, we did the same not only with the universities, uh, that is with the admix population, but we did the same on the Amerindian population, native population. So you can probably not read the uh, Q&A here because this is in uh, Amerindian language. And so we did the whole community engagement in uh, their own languages. Uh, it was pretty complex. It was pretty tough going to those rural poor areas and speaking about the double helix and how that uh, would contribute to um, to improving health and, 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 and social benefits. So, um, so by doing that, we established teams of uh, groups. We can see here people, we see Irma and Alfredo from my lab, and then in, uh, to the right we see a local professor who would be part of the, uh, of the consent to form process, and then two students who are um, contributing with, uh, with a sample and reviewing and signing the consent form before doing this. Same we did with the indigenous populations, and everyone received not only uh, a copy of their uh, consent form, but also a T-shirt that would read, I contributed with a sample, with a blood sample to the uh, genomic map of the Mexicans. So in any event, uh, the, the point here to, to make is that uh, we were able to get the attention, enthusiasm, and participation of people, even people who haven't, uh, you know, didn't have any formal um, training and that, um, and, and created this, uh, this um, interest in science and technology as a way, as a mean to improve local, uh, local, need, local health. And so we concluded the, pro the, the project and um, not only did the the we include the basis, but once the paper was published on that very day, we, we had a ceremony with, um, we had a ceremony here where I, um, where I was in charge of uh, uh, turning this uh, informational kit to the president, this is President Calderon in Mexico at the time, that not only did it include the PNAS paper, but also a uh, CD with databases and interactive, uh, interactive electronic tools so that people could uh, you know, get to know what a haplotype was and what their own population show as a result. And we also produced a series of comic books so for the people to understand the importance of the project and the results of the project. And just the same way we turned this kit to the president, we went back to all, of, all the communities across the country and gave an exact same kit to everyone who attended the uh, results uh, sessions that we conducted across the country. And so this is just an example as to how important it is uh, to get these communities in place and how uh, later on this is a further report <laughs> Um, that uh, was published on uh, indicating how uh, uh, the stunning amount of genetic diversity in the Mexican population. So this report came later in science, uh, yeah, in science, I believe, and, and then, um, so, so I'll stop here for a minute and make a parenthesis and say there is a country just south of the border uh, that has this stunning amount of diversity. We would want, do we want them to be part of our global alliance? Would they want to be part of the global alliance? This is, I think, uh, a clearly a win-win situation of a country, of an emerging economy, like many others around the world, that, we would that would be prepared to contribute significantly to an alliance like this and to benefit as well from the products of, the, of, of an effort like the one we're conducting here today. So um, this is uh, just to, to, um, to show that um, it is possible to get these things done. However, doing things like this in emerging economies are not, is not as easy as we do it in, in, in North America or Europe. There are hurdles, and we need to learn what those hurdles are so that we can engage them in our community, in our alliance, in our global efforts. And so 
some of the, um, so, so before I jump into, into that, I want to show a further study that was done. Uh, this is a grant that Eric Lander and myself uh, drafted initially for the Carlos Slim Foundation. I'm sure you've heard about Carlos Slim. And he was interested, he, even he got uh, uh, engaged in the genomics uh, revolution that we put together and he uh, chipped in with uh, 82 million US dollars to the initiative. And some of the results shown here uh, from the project uh, in, in, uh, in diabetes where uh, type 2 diabetes in Mexico has a prevalence of roughly two times of the U.S. non-Hispanic whites. Um, so there was a, a G, another uh, GWAS with 2.5 million SNP co coverage and over um, 8,000 8, Mexicans and other Latin Americans. And what's, what was impressive from this study is that there was a haplotype from this uh, solid carrier that uh, was associated with a 20% increase in the risk of type 2 diabetes. When you compare that 5-SNP haplotype shown in this cartoon at the bottom, um, and, and you compare it with the uh, uh, frequency of these allele in the 1,000 genome project, say, for example, we can see there is 0% in Africans, 2%, less than 2% in Europeans, uh, is not frequent in Asians, and it is 28% in the Mexican population. When we compare, when we analyze, when they analyze this haplotype in uh, the Sigma project, that is that this very project, 30% uh, of the Mexican population uh, had this, and when uh, the population was selected by the nati native ancestry, 48% of the population had this uh, type 2 diabetes um, um, uh, haplotype risk, uh, uh, risk haplotype. So, so clearly there are products, and this is paying off uh, from from this initiative. However, as I said, um, there are certain uh, hurdles in the way, and there are some lessons that um, are, are important to recognize. At that time, the Mexican government was uh, pretty excited about how genomics was uh, taking off, and uh, with all the reasons that I've already mentioned, but. There were, there were some events that were causing noise. Namely, foreign groups studying locals. There were uh, several groups. Uh, there was concern at that time with the, with the story of uh, the BRCA1 identifying certain population and uh, patented or not by a company. Things like that were ca causing noise. There were pharma groups uh, taking blood samples in indigenous populations without any consent form in exchange for Tupperware containers uh, as, as a payment for a blood sample. And, uh, um, and there were other uh, anomalies found, and in addition that, at that point, um, the Mexican government was uh, very sensitive in working uh, for the indigenous rights movement, which were protective and actively uh, and, uh, um, endorsed by groups of anthropologists and ecological groups. And so that came to create a situation where um, the Mexican government had to decide whether to shut down the whole genomics enterprise or set a series of rules that would uh, allow cooperation without, uh, without, um, without uh, any abuse. So the Mexican Congress came out with a law, the law of genomic sovereignty, uh, that indicates the DNA samples for population studies to leave the country need to have approval from a local IRB and will be included in a registry kept, kept by the Department of Health. That, that's just as simple as that. It's not a prohibition, but it was a rule so that nobody from other country could just come grab samples and leave, but do it collaborative with the Mexican, with the Mexican institutions. And that's, that's that for the genomic sovereignty law that is still in place. Um, uh, but as, as I said before, it is important to recognize that in, in emerging economies and as as uh, we observe in other countries, similar e economies in Asia uh, and, and Africa, uh, these are common denominators. Uh, when the leadership has scientific and global experience, major significant progress can be achieved in a short period of time. That is, uh, personal leaderships uh, are meaningful to making this progress. Um, and, and that's how uh, I uh, described the background of our Secretary of Health at the time. 
However, science and technology are not usually funding, pri funding priorities for emerging economies. Institutions are usually not robust enough to follow mid-long-term plans, but are too malleable to political calendars and personal interests. And certainly an effective mechanism to disseminate uh, uh, no new knowledge to the public and public policies way behind the advancement of science. And I know that uh, we heard earlier this morning when this is in the hands of government, it takes long. Well, believe me, when it is in emerging economies, it takes way too much time to be, uh, to be, to come in, in, in up to speed uh, in what is uh, public policy and science and technology. So this system is our fragile, fragile. These systems need to be uh, need to be engaged in a very specific way, so that uh, we so that uh, advantages and contributions can be taken when there's a good moment, but but in a way that they can benefit from alliances like this, even in the down times, even when there is not much support for these, having this electronic interaction with this benefit and access to information and uh, uh, genomic and clinical variant uh, variation uh, information uh, could be very useful for uh, this kind of economies, emerging economies. No, so um, as I said before, I like to uh, touch base on the on another issue that I believe is important, and and it is the role of genomics in the global economy. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Battelle report that analyzed the economic impact of the Human Genome Project, indicating, among many other things, that the Human Genome Project had a return on investment of 141 dollars. Per, for every dollar invested. That is over one trillion dollars to the American economy out of the investment uh, in the Human Genome Project. So clearly, that was pretty impressive to see what that money is, how much, uh, how much was that in uh, employment, how much was that in new business, how much is that in local, federal, and state taxes, and so on. And it was clear evidence that uh, investing, in time, investing in innovation in time pays off very significantly. So clearly, the virtual cycle of innovation where we can uh, pull together ideas and people across sectors and find new uses and applications for genomics, just as we're doing today in, in this room, as we do every day in this alliance, and then certainly having sustained investment in large uh, science and technology um, would, would fuel the innovation, and certainly the commitment of translating that into products and services that can maximize the impact across sectors. That virtuous cycle, it's what is transforming uh, uh, the economy based on uh, biotechnology, particularly in genomics. So um, I'd like to uh, uh, share for a few minutes my experience at the, um, at the OECD where I serve as the chairman of, bio, of the working part in biotechnology for several years, probably six, seven or eight years, um, where uh, the OECD, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, it's an uh, organization that was established in the 40s last, last century to rebuild Europe after the war. And when the task was done a couple of decades later, uh, the organization uh, pretty much focused on, uh, uh, on developing uh, guidelines, priorities, uh, guidelines um, and different documents to, uh, to uh, guide the different activities into growing economy and cooperation. Altogether with their strategic partners add up to more than 80% of, uh, of the world's GDP. So their, their opinion matters. And, um, and uh, I would say that uh, locally they were interested in developing, uh, uh, they noticed how important biotechnology in particular genomics was. And in 2009, they uh, produced this report that I would recommend you to read, uh, Bioeconomy 2030 by the OECD uh, Futures Program, where uh, it clearly shows trends around the world in different areas where uh, genomics is propelling the economy by the billions of euros and dollars. And so in this report, uh, clearly genomics shows an impact in the whole uh, value change and um, an important potential to enable economic growth and development. 
And so um, we started work in um, guidelines, principles, and best practices about genomics and genetics at that time. And um, it was included in different, these are the six areas that the OECD has, uh, indicated as major areas where genomics and biotechnology are contributing to economy. That's human health, veterinary medicine, uh, agriculture and food, industrial biotech, environment, uh, forensics, justice, and security. And um, so we started producing, as I said, uh, guidelines that have been uh, approved by all of the uh, uh, governments of the country uh, members. And, and these are just a few examples, uh, those related to human biobanks and genetic research databases, uh, those on uh, quality assurance of molecular genetic testing that are uh, very uh, current and, and useful uh, guidelines on licensing on healthcare genetics, that is uh, how to uh, practices for licensing of intellectual property rights that relate to genetic inventions. Uh, pharmacogenomics opportunities and challenges and getting closer to precision medicine biomarkers and targeted therapies um, and how, they, uh, how the development of these are coming to healthcare. So um, these principles and guidelines have been uh, pretty uh, popular in the country members, uh, but uh, we, in order to enhance our knowledge or their knowledge in, um, er, in um, genomics, we establish a, uh, a partnership with, uh, with HIGO, the Human Genome Organization, and together we reviewed the, uh, gen the economic impact of genomics in different areas and, and produced a series of uh, 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 summit, international summits, uh, whether it was a review in the bioeconomy, um, the converging technologies in genomics, uh, the synthetic biology, healthy aging, better food and nutrition, and coming up this uh, February 2017 in Barcelona, implementing personalized medicine opportunities and challenges. So clearly other organizations devoted to economic growth uh, and cooperation are looking into genomics in a different, a in, in whole different aspect, uh, but I, I, I would suggest that it is, it'll be important and timely to uh, join efforts with them. Um, then uh, into, in the year 2012, uh, as you probably know, the White House uh, published their um, blueprints for the bioeconomy, a very, interested, very interesting document describing how biotechnology and particularly genomics in the U.S. is contributing to propel the economy. Later that same year, the European Union did the same, and as time passed, uh, other countries uh, published their own national blueprints, and these are a few examples of those. And what was interesting, certainly, is that by the year 2014, some emerging economies put out a blueprint for to promote the bioeconomy, namely South Africa, India, Brazil, and Malaysia, as to how with their local context, focus on their local needs, uh, genomics and biotechnology will contribute to propel the economy. Some other countries that do not have a, f uh, in a, uh, a formal blueprint have, serve, uh, have uh, important policies uh, to propel the bioeconomy are shown at the bottom of this slide. And clearly, um, clearly, this is not uh, a crazy idea. This is something that countries are already that taking on to develop the, uh, the, the bioeconomy. Uh, and just as another example, in Mexico later, um, the OECD, Hugo, and our local genomics and bioeconomy organization had the participation of several institutions around the, the globe to review genomics, innovation, and economic growth in these areas shown here that, um, that uh, all of them are pretty much all of them, or most of them, are part of public health, it, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, animals, agriculture, food, they're all uh, interacting with uh, humans, and thus it's uh, part of the, in, in the interest of uh, public health. In any event, uh, that's, uh, that's um, to wrap up the OECD uh, contribution to genomics and public health, I like to highlight the uh, publication of a recent document, Public Health in the Age of Genomics, uh, by the OECD, where it describes drivers and criteria shaping the medical applications of genomic uh, biotechnology in different national settings. And it actually describes barriers uh, for implementation of uh, genomics in public health, but it describes local and regional barriers. Some of them are common to the world, some are very specific, and once again, I believe it is important 
important that we keep them in mind and, and, and in the process of engaging some of these countries to our global alliance. And, 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 and that's why I believe it is so important. We're so blessed to have our, our federated ecosystems for sharing genomic and clinical data where um, not only is it timely, but it's also uh, strategically, uh, uh, globally, and it's pertinent to what the globe is doing in terms of bringing genomics uh, to public health. And I believe, and as, uh, as Bartha mentioned this morning, and I like to emphasize, because I think we should be impressed and proud on the fact that um, this organization is innovative from its foundation. The fact that uh, we recognize the foundations of, uh, uh, and our principles are co and core elements for responsible data sharing uh, in in uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's something that makes us different, and hopefully other organizations around the, the globe will follow along with uh, the recognizing that our responsibility is not just not making harm, but uh, making sure that those participants, everyone around has uh, the, uh, the, the right to the medical and scientific advances that are made. And not only is this uh, good, uh, nice ideas that sound uh, sounds good, but the fact that this organization is focused on producing very specific actionable actionable products that can be uh, used by anyone around the, uh, the globe who is part of this alliance, I think that makes us different, and that, as I said, hopefully will uh, inspire the world to continue the, this uh, uh, job into uh, paving the way from human variation to uh, the clinical size and with that I will stop here and we're happy to take any questions thank you for your attention That's a very good point because uh, uh, one needs the other to uh, to be successful. That is, uh, it, it, in order to succeed uh, uh, economic-wise, uh, cooperation is it's essential. So what we've learned here is that having some base, basic principles and basic uh, ground rules, uh, things flow. And uh, Mexico in particular is a country that it's used to talking to their uh, developed world uh, neighbors. And so there's there's been uh, this uh, respectful dialogue with the world in um, in um, in, in, in collaborating uh, both in the science and now in the business. So I th I, I, what I've learned or what we've learned is that having basic rules of respect, which is nothing out of the ordinary, so just having them clear out there, it is important. And, and, and certainly the fact that we can collaborate and cooperate not only with the developed world but with other emerging economies is something that can help us identify um, niches of opportunities. So just to tell you an example, recently the OECD developed a, a worship in Malaysia to identify wh where the niches for genomics and bioeconomy will merge. And all of a sudden, they, it was clear to them that whether it's oil coconut, whether it's palm oil, whether it's shrimp, whether it's certain elements of, the, of their economic um, force turn out to be uh, similar to those in Mexico and in other countries. So lessons can be learned not only from the developed world, but among other countries, emerging economies, and developing nations. So cooperation and, and, and growth breaking rules, not walls, is what uh, makes us uh, strong. Yes? Uh, thank you very much. Your, uh, your response that you just made has kind of segued very nicely in the issue I wanted to raise, um, particularly about low and middle income countries. And I'm reflecting on some of the presentations from this morning where the unit of analysis is the research institute and uh, trying to have um, data assessment committees and so on. Whereas um, the work that I have been doing with the Human Variome Project on low and middle income countries is very much 
about uh, bridging this digital divide. And um, I guess my question is, do you really think that the, it's at the country level um, or, or where some of these interventions need to be made? I'm, I'm just a bit concerned that some of the, as I said this morning, this idea that the research institute um, is the kind of the un unit of analysis in kind of um, proof of concept. But isn't it really where we get more to the regulatory frameworks and uh, frameworks of responsibility and, and, and legislation where we need to be um, making sure that we're acting in that behalf if some of the benefits of this for public health is going to be realised in the not too distant future? I think you're right. There are different levels where uh, uh, action need to be taken. Certainly governments need to take responsibility to having the appropriate laws and at the appropriate time to, on the one hand, stimulate uh, innovation and cooperation at the same time uh, prevent from abusive uh, 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 partners, partnerships or behaviors. Uh, and that's when uh, we've observed that leadership, academic leadership and political leadership but I'm talking about politicians, educated politicians, can make enormous contributions to, uh, to uh, um, legal framework. However, when it comes to, uh, to identifying what the priorities are, not only the government and the research uh, uh, institutions are the ones to identify it, but the exper experience shows that the local communities and uh, the local economies, even the regional economies, are the ones that uh, are best to identify what their needs are mm -hmm. and how to address them. And so, so that's where um, interaction, networking with academic institutions and the local economies are local, I'm referring local within a country, yeah. can be very effective. If I may, I can't resist to add something, but we found very effective our relationships with UNESCO and the World Health Organization, that in many countries a mobilization of those uh, multilateral organizations to be effective, not in other countries, but in some countries it's a, a, a very positive thing to kind of uh, catalyze some right. of that. Right, yeah. and that's why I believe that efforts like this alliance could be very beneficial to other uh, countries into showing just general uh, principles and guidelines that could be beneficial for them to speed up and, um, and, and get on board with the genomics innovation. Thank you for your question. Martha. Hey, Gerardo, just a comment. Um, by the way, your comic books are, are translated, as you know, into English as well. It's very popular. Um, yep. um, all this work of the OECD, uh, I mentioned to you, where there will be a health data governance uh, document coming, recommendations from the council, uh, end of November with release probably in January. And, and all the OECD countries that you showed and so on, I think um, you'll find the recommendations in there to promote health data governance in the interest, in the public interest, is exact terms that are used in that document. So I think your work at the OECD is, uh, is continuing. And I'm glad you're joining efforts with the OECD and they benefit from your knowledge and experience. Uh, um, this has been a, a very uh, productive uh, uh, networking at the OECD with the genomic scientists and LC scientists from around the world. So Mr. Chairman, I think we're right on time. So I thank you again for your attention.